everybody. How you doing? Hi, everyone. I hope you had a good summer. Yes, yes. It's, it's now time for um, Genealogy Adventures Live. And if it looks different, that's because we are now on the radio. We are actually on the internet radio called Listen Vision Live. So you can now see us um, both online and as well as uh, on our Facebook page. So we're still trying to be able to keep in touch with you guys, talk to you guys, make sure everything, you know, if you have comments or questions for our guests or for us, then you'll be able to do that. So we're excited. Season three is gonna be awesome. We are, we are excited <laughs> and your eyes are not fooling you. We are actually in the same place. Yes, we're yes. together. <laughs> I know it's crazy. It's crazy. So let's go to the um, comments real quick. And we got Stephanie and Martha and everybody. Hello to you guys. Um, so we're gonna um, what do you what do you want to do first? Hello, David. Uh, good to see you too. Yes, yes. Well, if you'd like to introduce our guest. So today our show is going to be, our beginning show is going to be about Native American research. And we are very, very fortunate to have a chief. His name is Chief Lozado Langley. And he is out of South Carolina. I met him through my beloved Sheila Hightower Allen. And um, we are really going to talk to him and learn more about Native American research. Hi, how are you, Chief? I'm fine, and you? That's good. I haven't seen you in a while. It's been a very long time. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been deployed in Afghanistan, so I'm a defense contractor. Oh. So I spend most of my time working over there. Okay, okay. Well, we are really, really pleased to have you on the show because Native American ancestry and genealogy is it's a big topic. I mean, it we, we it see is. it we see it a lot of time on the various um, Facebook groups that we belong to, whether they're Native American in focus or not. And I think people just have a lot, a lot of questions about it. <clears throat> I know that um, I have a lot of questions for you um, in terms of developing tips and tricks and researching my own Native American ancestry. Okay. So um, I think we want to get we want to jump right into it. Uh, so you and I met through Sheila. And, yes. you know, that, that was both of our hearts in one way or another. <laughs> yes. And um, so one of the things that I would always talk to you about is how I can find out, like, I, I think I talked to you about when I first started to realize that my senior line were, um, were Native American. That's what I was told. But I didn't know how to go about finding it. So if you can, like, help people... Talk to them about how to go about researching their Native American, their possible Native American ancestry. How would they, you know, what's a good start for that? First thing I would say, if you, you need to start studying it from the aspects of Pacific states. And let me give you an example. South Carolina has the best preserved records on slavery and especially Native American slavery in any other colony. Okay. If you are of the Negro or African American or black or colored star, if you are searching Native ancestry, you need to look within the heart of slavery. And in the heart of slavery is where those strong connections are tied after Columbus. Now there are some other African ties pre-Columbus that I could talk about, but that goes a little more ancient. But studying the slave narratives and the colonial laws of South Carolina or the Carolinas, because inside the laws, it would tell you in South Carolina, if you read the Negro law, that both Africans Indians, meaning also Indians from India that are enslaved, they are not free, they are classed as Negroes. And most people think that Negro at that time had to do with color. 
That's not necessarily true. It had to do with a person who were enslaved, a human resource that was trafficked from Africa and the Americas and Asia. When you look at it from that perspective now, it's easy now to have a better understanding of what was going on. Most people try to just look, oh, my great grandma was a Cherokee, your great grandma. Well, in South Carolina, most people don't realize for 175 years, Cherokee was just a common word for saying you're Indian. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to be very careful. So what Indian are you talking about? Wow. And I have found through my studies and research that most people don't know what Pacific tribe and just says Indian. Now we got to have something to think about because in the records, when you study the British East India and the British West India Company coming out of South Africa and crossing the, or the Indian Ocean, because in South Africa, in Cape Town, you have the Indian Ocean on one side, the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. It's only a two-week boat ride. Many of those folks are not being trafficked up in the West Africa and Ghana coming across. So when you study from that perspective, and in South Carolina, then you found 66,000 East India slaves came into the colonies. Now, why I'm telling you this, because when you look at the census and trying to find Indian ancestry, and it says Indian, and you're in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, you really need to think now because that ancestor might be an East Asian that they call him that time, a Negro Asiatic that they call him at that time, or South Asia. I just want to clear this up before I get into the Native American factor because now when we deal with the Native American factor, we got to realize in the colonial North and Southeast, there were 2,000 ethnic groups of people. 2000. That 2000 got to be developed into five civilized tribes. Okay, if there are five civilized tribes, 1,995,000 well, other people are not civilized. So, what happened to these people? They just didn't die off because of smallpox and diseases and war. It means and means of people. But we have to look at, see, I examine history sometime. Most time, I examine it from the writer. I need to know what is his conscience and what is he thinking. Because when the writers wrote about Indian and African people in those days, they're very biased, prejudiced, and racist in the writings. So a trafficker will, will come up to a village and say, hey, there are only 200 people here not realizing what time they came into the country, the people might have migrated to higher grounds or to the farming grounds, depending on if it was winter or summer. So if you found 200 people here, they recorded, oh, it was only 200 of this nation. We had a little scrimmage and we wiped them all out. Really? I never believe God just created 200 numbers of a certain race of people. Wow, wow. So I don't, I don't follow that. Because if you go five or 10 miles down the road later on, you find these people again. So it's more than 200. <laughs> exactly. All right. Now, now with, with, with black people, with, with, with black African American colored Negro people again, we have to understand something here and now. And this is where a lot of people miss the boat. There's no 1619 for South Carolina and Georgia and North Carolina because of the Spanish. The Spanish came into South Carolina. And the Spanish was there 250 years before the British. So what happened to those villages and those Native American people? So if you take from that time frame, if your ancestors were still here and they're Native, if they converted to any religion, if it spans as Catholicism, your ancestors now in the 1700s 
have Spanish names. That's where Alonso, Mini that's where Alonso keeps coming from. Yeah, see? You know all this in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Chief, we're 50, almost 15 minutes into the show. You have officially blown my mind. <laughs> now I understand why so many of us from Edgefield are getting those trace amounts of Southeast Asian and yeah. East Asian. Because yeah. honestly, we, we couldn't well, work out why that was. Yeah. Well, since you said that, and I'm from the Edgefield area as well, I can give you a few more others. See, there's two Edgefields. <laughs> and see, most most people don't realize that. In my research, I have found Mongolians named Bubba Smith or John Roberts. Why? Because these particular Mongolians who were slaves fought in the Revolutionary and the Civil War. So when you go in the War Department documents, it tells you this particular individual came from Mongolia. But in South Carolina, South Carolina classed all Asians as black and colored on the census. So if you don't know where your ancestors come from now, you really, ooh, somebody walking around with what appeared to be Chinese eyes, you call them China man or China lady. These people got Asian ancestry. That's why the lady because, made the comment that she made on the, the 50 cent thing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, exactly why she said that. Wow. Exactly. Now, when you go in South Carolina Corner Colonial Records and go read the diaries of certain plantations' families, you will find now, because most people think when I come up to the census, and I try to find my people enslaved, all I find is a number. Well, that's just for tax purposes. I can honestly tell you, they didn't send people on a chopping block, I'm sorry, on a slave auction block saying, slave number one, slave number two, slave number three. These names. people had names. had names. And when you look at the slave registration, the slave registration will tell you because they're selling people for product now will tell you the genetic makeup of that particular ancestor. So Chief, um, I wanted, there was something that I should have done at the very beginning, and that was tell them who you are. Like, um, who are you Chief of? You know, what is the name of the tribe that you've come from? Because we didn't introduce that part. True, and um, a little bit about how you even got onto this journey. I'm, I'm from an ethnic group of Native Americans called Uchis. And it's also spelled U-C-H-E-A-N. A lot of people think that we are Creeks. We're not, because we speak a different language. Now, when I was given this task, because I did not want it, my grandmother placed it in my hand. I'm an engineer, I'm a defense contractor. My degree is in electronic engineering and computer science. I have traveled over 87 foreign countries in the 53 years I've been living. I enjoy the travel. I love it. I did not want the responsibility of this. My grandmother said, no, you will do it. And your father, meaning my grandfather, because my grandparents raised me when I was three days old, we will be watching and guarding you from the other side. And the reason you are chosen, because you have the courage. You have the know-how. You will deal with this. I also had a great, 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 which would be my grandmother's great-grand-aunt, and Aunt Laura lived to be 114 years old. So when I was growing up, she was 100. But when I got off the school bus between the ages of 7, 8, and 9, and 10, I had to go to Aunt Laura's house. She was right across the road from me. So I wasn't allowed to have dump trucks and all that stuff around Aunt Laura's house. No. We're going to sit down and talk. And when Aunt Lar would mentor to me 
a lecture to me. It was an insult to her if I wrote anything down. She said, no, you're going to listen to me. You're going to put it in your head here, and no one's going to take it away from you. At the time, my Aunt Lar, remember, because this was in the 70s, my Aunt Lar remembered her mother telling her when Sherman came through and Aunt Laura was a little girl around two or three. So I got all that history from her, all of it. And what I did when I began, when, when, when I got older, started looking into the things that was told to me. So you, you, you got to remember now, in slavery times, they kept knowledge away. Certain people could only read and write. They kept, they created laws during Jim Crow years. You can't be an attorney, so you're not going to find out what's going on with the law. You can't be a police officer, so you're not going to find out. Right? So a lot of the history that deals with Negro, Black, colored, and African-American people comes from all histories. Now, the key to that is that those old histories is backed up by some facts. When I started digging into the archives, that's when I realized the Indians in the area that were enslaved, they class as Negro people. So then I took time out, and you guys can do it too. If you go to the Harvard Institute and look up the social construct Negro, it will tell you a person that is nearly one sixteenth African according to law. So, so go ahead. I'm going to kind of roll back and just get really basic with my first question. So as mm -hmm. I said, you kind of blew my mind talking about how basically everyone who wasn't European was classed as Negro. So mm -hmm. if we're trying to do the research on, through the records, trying to figure out if our older generation of ancestors were actually African or came from Southeast Asia, East Asia, going up into Mongolia, what would you, how would you suggest people actually start digging into that, digging into those distinctions? Go into the plantation records for one, read, the inventory of the Pacific slave master. And in his slaves, bill of sale is where the origin of these people came from. Because many a times back then, they wasn't using the word African right. to describe where your people came from. If your people was Angola, they would say Angolan. Right. If your people came from South Africa, they would say a bush man, a bush woman. Because we've seen if your people seen. came from Ethiopia, you will find that. But I'm going to tell you something that's very significant. And I was working with, uh, with one thing about Sheila. Sheila would push me. Yes, she would. <laughs> and I'm like, Sheila, it's 11 o'clock at night. Mainly, I need this information. So we came across something that says, Adamine. And this was a lady that was on one of the farms in Georgia, and her people came from Adamine. And that's what they called her because when she ran away, they said, This particular negress. See, that's something else you got to look for right now. I've seen that. When, when, when they are tracing women, is negress, not Negro. So this particular Negress came from Adamon, which means she came from the Adamon Islands. And the Adamon Islands now is that isolated island that's all from India, where you see these very dark people with African-looking features with very straight hair, straight hair. That particular slave came from there. Now, I'm not going to sound vulgar, but this is a very teaching moment, and I want you to listen to this very carefully. There is a tribe in Africa right now. In St. Simon's Island, 
Sheila and I, and my buddy Harry Hillary, who was a Gullah that passed away, brought me a mystery to solve. There was a slave woman that was sold two times. Her name was P-U-S-S-Y. Growing up as a child, we think that's vulgar and something else. There's the P-U-S-S-Y people in Kenya today. What? So it's not vulgar. That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. What? So really it's about going back over records that you may have looked at a thousand times and actually seen them. Exactly. You can't go back and see that word was twisted. Yeah. That's where she came from. So now to back it up even further, I went to Egypt over a year ago and met a woman traveling on her passport. Her last, her first name was Vanessa. Her last name was P-U-S-S-Y. I said, whoa. She said, what's wrong? I said, in my country, she said, see, that's a history you guys don't know. Wow. So that word in what? Kenya, that particular tribe, those people are royalty. So look what they took. So look what the Western turned and did with the word, and look how we look at it. Right. Was Finding that, you the same go ahead. Way, I mean, was the name was it pronounced the same way, or was it pronounced differently? They pronounce it the same way, but they don't put the emphasis on it like they do here in America. Okay. Okay. So I've got a quick question for you as well. Go ahead. So you were talking about how you you learned your family history in a very oral in a very oral tradition. So. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind European standards of geneal genealogical best practice, how would you suggest that people put family lineages that are orally handed down into their tree, but to do it in a way that you can show that it's been sourced? I will say those family lineages that have been passed down orally can be backed up by research. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's going to be documented. So One. Yeah. The slave narrative, the, there are 10,000 slave narratives. I've read 990 of them. Out of the 990 that I've read, 870 of them had Indian ancestry. But I'm thinking even earlier back, <clears throat> I'm thinking specifically of my Pamunkey ancestry in Virginia before the, before the Europeans even got here. So speaking to one of the tribal elders there, I mean, he was able to rattle off about at least nine to 10 generations of, a, of one family line. He's like, no, if you want to talk about these other families, I can put you in touch with other historians who can pretty much do what I just did with um, with your family. So mm -hmm. I have most black people, most most people that can remain history like that and take you back generations. Their family didn't go further north, and if you're in South Carolina, they didn't go to Detroit, they didn't go to New York, they stayed. Right. My family history goes back to 1555, when I start talking the native side, because those words of those people were passed down through my great great grand aunt. I didn't know what she was talking about. <laughs> Now, let me, let me share something else with you that you guys can do. There's something called the Slave Manifest. And the Slave Manifest are the ship records with slaves on them. Or I hate to say slave, I enslaved people. But you will find that the color black didn't have stuck because we easily could have become called brown. I've seen hundreds of slaves class as brown gold, copper, black, pitch black, blue black, purple, almond, olive. By the way, olive is black if you look at it, pure olive, it's dark. So you find these things in the slave manifest. But now there's different laws in the colonies governing 
African slaves and American slaves that are Indian but class as Negro. Dig this. If a Native American slave ran away, they branded them on the left side of the cheek. Africans are different. Those Omega signs on the shoulders and on the hips. I understand the frat brothers want to get down with that, but they better look at the origin of these things. So that's where you find a lot of the African slaves. Brand on the shoulders and the hip, but on the cheek are the Native American slaves. Well, you say, well, Langley, how, how is that? Because that's one of the colonial codes that George Washington passed down that they practice on South Carolina plantation. So how is this possible? Because in the Revolutionary War, they created codes that said, okay, your slaves can go fight for you. So many of the white Southerners never fought in the Revolutionary War, not the Civil War. They sent their slaves. Now these slaves are enlisted and have these marks on their cheeks. These are Native American slaves. That are fighting in the Civil War. So you have all of these records. You find these also in the muster rolls. You find these also in manunitions. You find these also in Revolutionary War paper. You find these also in land warrants and land grants because most of our ancestors that inherited land and became free people of color came out of that Revolutionary War. Then they received 500 or 600 acres of land, depending on the notorious medal of honor of whatever they did. They granted them those lands, and they held those lands until the Civil War and lost. So another question I have is if I were if I were to find that I actually had ancestors that lived in territory that had been controlled by the Yuchi, mm -hmm. and hopefully people can extrapolate what you're going to say to think about the states that they came from, what resources or repositories would, would you recommend um, people access? When it comes to the Yuchi people, because there's a lot, it's a lot different. There's something called the 1898 census taken of the five civilized tribes. In this particular census report is very unique because you're going to find out what Indian tribes that were in slavery at that time and how did they class these people. Now, for most Southern people, always want to go to Oklahoma. I'm sorry. If you come up out of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, you don't need to look for Oklahoma if you got any Indian ancestry. You need to look into the Seminoles because the Seminoles fought a 50-year war. And the Seminoles, many of them, well, let me stop for a second. Seminoles are no more than Native American slaves that ran away from the British and other Native American tribes. And in the process of that, Africans and Asian Indians, because this is in the records, went with them off them Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina plantations. Now, in the Seminole records, and not only in the Sem Seminole records, and some Census records in Georgia, but mostly in Florida. And South Carolina have a few, but mostly Florida. When you start researching around Jacksonville, you're going to find people listed as Indian Negro. Because those people were part Native American and part African. And in no census records, I'm telling you, when you go start looking through the Seminole records, you are running now into thousands of people. So we have a question from one of our um, viewers. She says, um, Tiffany Hutzman, she says, where do you search where you 
when you have fourth and sixth cousins who are enrolled native yet your immediate and closer DNA matches who whose names have been changed or you have no record yet you have native DNA showing up on your test. That makes sense. That's a quick tricky question, but I'm going to answer it the best way I know how. Okay. Enroll ancestors. Those relationships are based upon government roles. In other words, if you and I join a, a native nation today because we are living in that country and because we're in that country, just like the United States, we take a test and we get those rights, we become an American citizen. Although we can barely speak Chinese, I mean American, but we speak full Chinese, or we speak some other African language. But in the midst of the United States now, recreate Chinatown. Okay, many of the Native American towns were named after African people. Hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to get to the point. Those relationships, and they're talking in role members, that's a social relationship. That has nothing to do with the necessity. See, you have Indians, then you had something called Indian countrymen. And Indian countrymen were Europeans or Africans that ran into Indian country, learned Indian languages, dressed like Indians, and became Indians of those nations. But they're not ethnically. Okay. So their DNA is going to stand with what it is unless, and most of those at that time were men who were Indian traders and took on or cohabitated because laws prevented them from legally marrying Indian women, but they cohabitated with them. And because they cohabitated with them and married them, gave them perks to trade and statue in those nations. So a European or African could have, could became a chief. Okay. Wow. Because that particular individual now can go communicate for us with the European or the African, either one, which doesn't matter. So when it comes to Oklahoma, and this is something a lot of people in the South, especially black people, Negro and colored, need to be very aware of. Most of those names are common names. They don't apply to you, especially when it comes to the Freeman role. Now, people will say, well, how is that possible? I, let me give you an example. My grandmother was born in 1912 in Steelwell, Georgia. This was Steelwell, Oklahoma, 1912, Ruben Lee Roberts. I know good doggone well mama ain't never been in Oklahoma. <laughs> so I'm not going to fly with that. But I, I, I'm going to tell you how my family continued to validate our ancestry because in 1910, there was a special Indian census given throughout the United States, and especially the South. It lasted three years from 1910 to 1913. Most people don't even know this exists. So, so when the census takers came back and wanted to document every single individual who had any native ancestry because South Carolina, most people don't know, slavery didn't end in South Carolina until 1908. So you got all these people who are Native Americans and African walking around are not citizens. So those slavery two, goes, go ahead. Those two censuses that you just referenced, especially the 1910, are those available mm -hmm. for people to see online? Can they access oh, of those? Course, of course, of course, you know where to access those. Yes, I have copies of them. The Special Indian Census of 1910 to 1913. Google it and watch what comes up. Wow. 
So are the, some of these, because that was another question up here, um, are a lot of these, where can any of these records be found on Ancestry? Because a lot of people have that, you know, Ancestry has this whole conglomerate running. Over. I know, see, what, what you have to understand, I research history from an investigative perspective. I study genealogies from a friend's forensic perspective. Right. I don't know if Ancestry going to give you that information because Ancestry may be following some federal guidelines. Yeah, and the federal guidelines is the only people in America who are Indian have to be federally recognized by these guidelines. And these are the roles Government roles, the Dawes, the Millers, various other roles that you need to comply by. So then how would they find some of these records, you know, that, that you're talking because, about? Because, because now, black people need to take the Negro approach that I call to research and ancestry. Go and read the records that I told you about, the slave narratives, the special census, because in the special census, it breaks it down to county, township, village. It also breaks it down to the person's name. And these things can be Googled. Now, of course. I got book. Well, yes. But I also have this information. That's something else Sheila pushed me with. We have them on the houseofancestry.org website. On that particular website, we have over 55,000 digital documents. Can you just and those documents concern, concerns South Carolina mostly, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. What's can you the name just, of that again? Yeah, I was going to say, can you repeat that? Yeah, what, what's the name of that website again? www.houseofancestry.org. Okay. Got it. She will... <laughs> Yes. Sheila was an educator. Yes, yes, I'm a researcher. Sheila used to get on me by spelling. I said, Sheila, I ain't got you handle that. I'm just finding this information. <laughs> so Sheila started cataloging stuff and got me in the habit. Sheila is what forced me into public speaking. Yeah, she tried, she tried me. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to just no. know. She's like, no. <laughs> because no one is going to tell this history the way you're going to tell it because you are a product of this history. So let's work on your processes and your deliveries. Okay. That's what I, I've gotten. So to sum this up, the 1910 to 1913 Special Indian Census. Yes, and that, one. Thank you, Karen, for uh, posting the link to that. Because a lot of people in South Carolina at that time are not free, not until 1924. But let me, let me tell you something that's very, very significant. Most people, another thing is going to pop up. My ancestors now in 1920 are listed now as Mexicans. Hmm. So we go from Indian to Mexican, mulatto. Now, my Yuchin oldest ancestor that we know of, Mariah, because she was on the special Indian census of 1910 to 1913. But when they go now and list her, because you got to pay very close attention to this, her color is listed as black. Her race is listed as a Miri Indian. Mm. This is back in the 1900s. It didn't say American. It said a Miri Indian. Now, what most of us do, we really don't pay attention to words that when we see them, we just assume. So I would recommend anybody who have ancestors living at that time, because my great, great, great grandmother, Mariah, lived to be 100. 
Many a times on the census from 1860, 1870, 1880, they're going to ask you a question, what is the color? They ain't say nothing about necessity. Because my great-great-grandmother couldn't speak English, couldn't write it. So what are the languages that many of those people speaking now coming up out of slavery? They're not speaking English. They're still speaking their native languages. You really don't need to know English to be a slave. You need to know how to pick cotton and corn and rice and everything else. There are families like this, but institutionalized learning don't give us this type of history. You have to go get that from the scholars and the writers who have been in the pits researching this. So taking this to the most basic level for a lot of our, for a lot of new genealogists or people who are new to research. So if I'm wanting to get a sense of, or if I wanted to learn more about Native American tribes in the specific area, would you suggest more looking at local resources, regional local. resources, and state? Look in the state archives, but let me, because I'm looking at you, and I need to give you and Tanya something, Donna something that's very significant here about Edgefield. Listen to me very carefully when I say this. Over 10 years ago, in the South Carolina archives, I stumbled across a document. It startled me. It wasn't until 12 years over, years later, I had an eyewitness account. But this is what happened. In 1834, in the old 96th district, in Edgefield. Now, what you got to understand, the Edgefield of yesterday is not the same Edgefield today because the, the area was more broader. That's like Civil Bluff. There are two Civil Bluffs. Civil Bluff expanded over 46,000 acres. Most people don't even know this. They're just going by what a lot of European writers wrote. And, and one thing you have to not pay attention to sometimes, historical markers, because they might not be accurate. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you all about Edgefield. It's very significant. Listen carefully. In that document, it says there were 700 Egyptians and Indians in this community. Egyptian. When we tax them, yes, listen to me, Governor. When we tax them and they become citizens, they will be known as colored, free colored, or free blacks or something they call mezzos, M-E-Z-I-T-O. Now, listen to me carefully. I went to Egypt a year ago. Well, prior to that, stop. Let me, let me give you another little factor. My, grand, my great-grandmother's first cousin, daughter, which will make him my third cousin, Son took a DNA test. Now, his father is half European. We understand that. But his DNA came back, and he took a test with ancestry. 40% Egyptian, 20% Native American. Wow. So we're like, whoa. So I talked to my uncles. So you know what? It's time to dispatch the Yuchi. So I went to Egypt. Listen to me when I tell you this, because there's two times the ancient Egyptians came into America. So I went to Cairo, but where I needed to go was Luxor and Aswan. As I'm coming through immigrations, the Egyptians in Cairo asked me for an Egyptian passport. I'm not Egyptian. Somebody in your family came from here because there are people in Luxor and Aswan look just like you. I'm like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> I ain't trying, no. So, so I'm saying no, and these guys are getting frustrated because they're serious now, and they have me pulled aside in immigration. 
So I got to pull out all my government ID now because it, it's, it's gotten serious. They don't call security. I'm not. The guy said, okay. He said, young man, there were two. There was an older one. There was a younger one. The young one said, bro, you need to go to asthma. I'm thinking, bro, there's a word we only use in America. That's a common word over there for young brother in Egypt. I'm like, man, we grew up using that word. I'm listening to everything now. So the next day, I book a flight, and I don't fly for two days down south because it's 800 miles. So I fly into Luxor. The minute I get off the plane, some spiritual, supernatural, metaphysical stuff start happening. Mm. My chest rise up. Whoa, what's going on? I catch a cab, go to the hotel. I'm going to the hotel. I'm walking to the desk. Everybody's looking at me. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So I got some toilet tissue or something on my shoe or something. Somebody said, like, kick me in the back or something. And the guy went to the, at the front desk, said, hey, check in. He said, I need you to see the manager. The manager comes out. My back is turned. He grabs me on the shoulder. The chills come before I turn around. When I turn around, I see the same guy who could pass for my great-grandfather's brother. They look so much alike. Wow. And he said to me, where are you from in America? Are you from the Carolina or South Carolina? I'm like, whoa, me and him didn't have this conversation. He said, we had people that was taken from here in the mid 1700s and sent to the Carolinas to grow cotton. Wow. That's an awesome story. That that's that's an that's an awesome story. Chick, you have like just really um done so much and i wish we could continue our talk uh maybe we'll have you back on the mm -hmm. show again you know we're gonna have you back on not a maybe we're gonna have you back on the show for certain and um but we're like five minutes out i just okay. want to thank you so much for you know being our first show and just giving us okay. this history and talking to us the way that you have it's just been awesome because there's still more questions there's just a lot more questions I I have the House of Ancestry Facebook groups. I'm on vacation for 60 days, so I'm going to be home until October. Okay. And I do a few online lectures myself. But if they join the House of Ancestry Grassroots Genealogical Society on Facebook, they can connect with me. We have genealogical conference calls every Thursday night between 8 and 9. And I put that information out. And I go into details and I discuss all of these things. So but I'm going to let you guys know, this is very important. You come out of Edgefield, <laughs> you are looking at Nubians and Native Americans and some Scottish and German. Yes, you are. Oh, yes. <laughs> In that particular me, area. <laughs> I'm telling you now, because I, I, I age. I've already been to Egypt. I confirmed that. I have that information, but I have a lot more other information on the settlements of the Scots and the Germans and the Africans, Native Americans, because in that lower Savannah River district, they had little separated villages because they were taxing people differently and whatever your necessity was is how you was being taxed. Right. That's how a lot of these mixed race communities come about. So what I would like for you to do is um, send me the link of the House of Ancestry so that later on we can repost it onto our, because this is also streaming on Facebook as well as the okay. internet radio station. And if you send okay. me um, that link, I'll be able to put it on the on the on the comment section so everybody can okay. have it and then they'll be able to get in and mm -hmm. you know talk on house of ancestry. But thank you once again. Thank you so much. You, you have blew, blew my mind in the best way possible. Yes, yes. We will You're definitely welcome. have you back on the show. Okay then. All right. Have a good one. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
So okay. sorry, yeah. Tiffany, um, you did ask a question about rejected application forms. And I can tell you from my own conversations with the Pamunkey elders, um, that once those applications were rejected at the federal level, that kind of killed everything. But you can still use those as excellent resources for genealogy, especially as they provide multi-generations worth of information. Yeah, and, and Stephanie, you're absolutely right. This was an awesome show. Like, he just kind of set us down and just talked. And I'm, I'm, I loved it. I don't know about you, Brian, but I loved it. And I'm really happy we're here. So am I. Um, I hope you guys like our new setup. This is going to be how we're going to be. And let's quickly tell you about the next show. So the next show, which is going to be the 15th of September, is Gullah Genealogy and History with Althea Sumter. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to get into that Gullah Geechee stuff. And she's going to talk to us about that. And if you think um, Chief Langley was something, wait till you meet Miss Althea. She is everything so um i did get a little teary eyed you know but i'm okay when he was talking about sheila but yeah she she just made that's she's the reason why we do a lot of the things that we're doing with the project and mm -hmm. because she just made sure that you did what you had to do but um and in other news in october starting in october we're right. going to be weekly every sunday at four o'clock yes 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 so you guys just get ready and um, get your pens, your paper, bring your tea, whatever <laughs> it is you want to drink, you know, and sit down and let's get this going because we're really trying to push and educate. Just like Sheila did with him, we're trying to do with you guys. We're trying to educate and, and make sure that you know. So I'm Donya. I'm Brian, and thank you so much for sharing not only just your Sunday, but your holiday weekend with us. Enjoy the rest of it. And, yes. Uh, we will see you on the 15th. All right, goodbye. Without no cheese like Moving along while we sing a song Don't rhyme to the beat without moving your feet Yo, hear my rhyme, it's wake up time So get your white ass out of bed See, I am one Stop the rock to the bang bang the boogie say up jump to the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie the beat. Yo, what you feel? Yo, I'm a rock and roll beat. Yo, this is the rule and my score. We gon' try to move your feet. Hey, this is Cliff Pop. You hear them? If they hit me, the Cliff Pop. The pop's in it, don't stop. Copper, see, we bang bang boogie. We get them. Oh, goody, keep your hoodie when you're fucking with me. Well, my name is known all over the world by other pops and ladies and the pretty girls. I'm going Understanding education, beat crimes, DJing graffiti, all that good stuff. This is incredible. Like, no, I'm DMC and I don't want to come and book time and make my demo and do the video. This speech is my recital. I think it's very vital to rock. Around. That's right. On top. Here we go. Yo, what's up, y'all? This is me.